it means our kids sleep later than they normally do. So that's why all these families are here at the 11. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back at the 9 next week, all right? It's nice to, nice to have y'all here, though. Uh, hey, we have a team in Mexico right now, and they're serving the Lord. Praise the Lord. We should clap for that. Yeah, wow. You yeah. know. Okay. Man, y'all really, you know, are y'all awake? Are we awake? Uh, the gospel is being delivered in many beautiful ways in Mexico with our partners down there. There's about 10 of City Light team members. City Light, there's a City Light Center in Tijuana, Mexico, just in case those of you don't remember. Uh, one of our ministries, uh, what we hope to do around the world is start these centers to bless communities, partner them with local churches. So whether we have to start a church, we'll do that. Uh, but if not, there's a great local church like there is in Tijuana called La Roca. We'll partner with them uh, to really bring light into dark places. So they're out there doing that. They'll be there till Tuesday. So just have that in mind. If you think about it, pray for them, that the Lord bless them, keep them safe, use them mightily. Uh, they would be a real blessing to those on the ground. We also had a team who just got back from Nicaragua. <laughs> Woo, Yeah. Uh, doing a lot of evangelism, pastor training, serving the city, blessing the local churches. Uh, that was a fairly large team, 15 to 20 people. And, and so we're really thankful for that. Next week, come, because you're going to hear a little bit about what God did in both places. They'll both be here uh, to share about that. And I just want to encourage you that as you participate in the life of City Light, uh, we're trying to fulfill the Great Commission to take the gospel to all nations and all peoples. Uh, and we're excited to be a part of that. There are a couple more trips open this year, Guatemala, Uganda. So if you're like, man, I want to go serve the Lord cross-culturally somewhere, uh, learn a lot and use my skills to bless uh, a place, would you please look that up? You can join us on one of those two trips. All right, today uh, I want to help you. I'm going to help you deal with the persistent, troublesome feeling you have that things are just out of place. You know how it is when you just, there's just something not quite right, you know. Life is a lot like Goldilocks. It's a little too hot, it's a little too cold, you know. And what you're looking for is something that's just right. But the problem is most of our life isn't lived in that reality that things feel just right. And the reality for us is that most of our life and a lot of our life we feel out of place. And so I want to help you navigate that situation, that feeling, that reality in life. And I want to help you find your place today so that you can live secure in what God has made you to be. You know, some of you know this feeling because you're super organized people. You feel this all the time. As a matter of fact, you walk into this sanctuary, you're like, all this stuff is out of place. You know, uh, you're like, this thing, this thing. Okay, you walk into your, your, your bedroom, there's one, you know, dirty clothes on the floor, one dirty shirt. You're like, man, this is out of place. You get the heebie-jeebies, all right? Uh, some of y'all need a little bit more of that. Your whole, like, your whole bedroom's out of place, okay? You need to put it in place. Uh, uh, all of us know that that's where you shove everything when people come over, all right? You just close the door, you just put it all in there, uh, and everything looks good. Everything looks good outside. But you say, man, my, my charger's not in the wall. It feels out of place. You know, this drives you nuts. There's a few papers on your desk. You say, like, man, uh, things being out of place drives you absolutely nuts. Now, we all know this when we lose something. You know, you're going to the, you're getting ready to go. You're getting ready to walk out the door. You go right to where your keys should be on the little hanger thing right side of the door, and they're not there. You know, we've all had that feeling. You think, oh, my goodness, where are those keys? You know, nobody likes the feeling that follows that moment. Think, where are my keys? Where are they at? Okay, then you begin to think, where did I leave them? Are they on the bed? Are they in my jacket? It feels out of place. Now, because something is out of place, you feel stressed. And you begin to create anxiety. Things begin to feel overwhelming. And that's true for our life in so many ways. How about social situations? So many of us feel out of place. Whether you're going to a new school where you don't know anybody or whether you're starting a new job where you don't know anybody or whether you go to that party that the one friend invited you is the only person you know there, you know, and you feel out of place the whole time that you're there. You're just attached to that person like a Siamese twin. You're stuck to them. Uh, you're trying to find a place. You know that feeling when you are out of place. You know, D.C. feels like this a lot because of how particular people are about certain political parties or things. Uh, there's a lot of, you're in this place, and if you're not in this place, then you're out of place, and it creates a lot of division, or especially the desire around here to have power and authority, to be in a place of a decision maker, to be in the right party at the right time, to have influence and make decisions. I mean, so many people around us live for these things. We live to find our place, and when we don't have that place, we feel out of place. You know that feeling in many things in life, but the worst is when it's true for your soul. This is the deepest, most troublesome reality of our lives is when the deepest, most important part of our life feels out of place. When your soul feels out of place, life begins to feel overwhelming. 
you feel consistently stressed or anxious, or you know the best word I thought for all this is just unsettled. Just unsettled. You know, you might not be overwhelmed with depression, anxiety. You might not even be struggling that much, but you know, you're just unsettled. It's like you've been sitting in the seat too long. You're starting to squirm a little bit. You know, that's how life feels. You're just not quite right. Things aren't quite right. Sometimes you can name it, and there's certain situations that bring that up. Sometimes you can't, and you just wake up or you live feeling like, man, I'm just so unsettled. Things are just not quite right. Well, I want to help you navigate that today and help you get back to where you need to be. Here's the basic truth the scripture is going to present to us today is that when the right things are in place, we will live in peace. This is what I hope for you. I mean, this is what the Bible is offering us in this particular part we're going to look. This is God's end goal in the world is shalom. It's peace. It's a place of peace. And God has done something to help you get the right things in life in place so that you can live in peace. This is what God's going to show us today through the word. But so often, instead of taking God's route, we take other routes. And when we feel out of place or when we feel unsettled or when we feel like we just don't know what will really help or satisfy, sometimes we say, hey, sometimes we think maybe wealth will do it. And you think, well, if I just had my money in place, I would no longer feel out of place. Or maybe some of us think romance will do it. And if I just had a relationship in place, then I would no longer feel out of place. Or maybe for many of us, it's a job to think, if I just had my job, the right job in place, then I would no longer feel out of place. Or some of you, it's the getting into the right school. You say, if I was in the right school, I would no longer feel out of place. Or maybe some of you, it's a family situation. You say, if I just had the right family dynamic in place, then I would not feel out of place. Or if I just had access to that particular group, my life would be in place and I would no longer feel out of place. How often are these the stories we tell ourselves? But you know the truth and the reality. We've all lived long enough to experience this where you finally get your money in place and yet your life still feels out of place. You know that. Instinctively, this happens in your life. You finally get that job in place, and yet your life still feels out of place. You've walked into this room. You finally got the relationship in place, single no more, you know, but your life still feels out of place. You finally got your health and your body in place, and yet your life still feels out of place. This is true for us, and this is why it makes it so difficult, because no matter what problems we solve, we just encounter others. And when we think we finally found our place, we realize that we have not. And what we thought would take care of that unsettled feeling does not. And we end up getting really struggling and stressed about this reality. And here's what I want you to understand this morning, is that no matter what things in your life fall into place, you will always feel out of place when your soul is not in the place of God's presence. Here's the fundamental reality of your life is that no matter what falls into place, no matter what worldly thing works out, no matter what money you get and what success you enter into and what job you get and what relationship you have and what health you experience and what places you get to be, your life will always feel out of place unless you are in the place of God's presence. This is what you are made for, and this is the shalom, the peace that God wants to have for you. It is only available in his presence. And so the goal of the Bible in this particular part, and therefore my goal in this message this morning, is to get you back into the place that you belong. Some of you, this will be for the first time, is to finally put your trust in Christ, to understand what he has done for you on the cross and in the resurrection, to find your place with God through repentance and faith. And God is calling you out this morning. And for many of you, it will also be a renewal and a return to the place in which you belong. You have strayed away, maybe not too far, but you have strayed away and you feel unsettled for that particular reason. And so I wanna help all of us live in the peace by the, finding the place that God has for us. So go ahead and open your Bible to Ephesians chapter two. All right. We're going to work through it section by section. What I'm going to do is give you a three-step process for getting your soul and your life back in place again. So the first one is this, and it comes from Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read the verses first, verse 11 through 12. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope 
and without God in the world. We're going to stop there for a minute. Here's step number one to getting your life back in place. It's this. It's to remember what you were. It's to remember what you were. And before I tell you to remember what you were, I need to make the caveat that some of you, this is still what you are. And so I'm going to talk to some brothers and sisters in Christ who are professing Christians about what they used to be. But I want many of you maybe watching online or you're here today or maybe a friend brought you. Praise God. I want you to read these things as what you currently are which is why life feels so hopeless and problematic. But for many of us in Christ, this is who we were. And so I want to talk to both of you this morning, who you are, who you were. But Paul is specifically talking to the church and to a group of people who know and claim Christ. He's talking to Christians. And what he wants to do is help them remember what it was like to be out of place. Remember that. You see this twice. Verse 11, therefore remember that. Verse 12, remember that. And you know this is true when something's out of place. What do you do? You retrace your steps. How do I find something? How do I get something back in the right place? How do I get the keys back on the hanger where they belong? How do I get the charger back in the wall where it should be? I retrace my steps. What are some questions you ask yourself? Do you think, well, what was I doing? Before I realized that something was lost or out of place, you think, what was I doing? Where was I? Oh, what was I doing at the moment? Who was I talking to? What kind of situation did I find myself in? Could the keys be in the car? Could they be in my jacket? Could they be, you know, I was talking to this friend. I went to the coffee shop. Then I hear, oh, my goodness, did I leave it at the coffee shop? You know, you think all these different things. You say, okay, you got to retrace your steps. Now, this is true spiritually for your soul that the way you find your place again is to retrace your steps and to remember what it was like to have no place apart from God. Here's the reality behind this, is that if we remember what we were, we will be more thankful for who we are now. And if we remember where we were, we will be more thankful for where we are now. You need to retrace your steps. How often could we say, how often is this true of us, And this will change our perspective. If you looked at your situation, you said, I don't totally like where I am right now, but I'm so thankful to not be where I was. How about I don't totally like who I am right now, but boy, am I thankful to not be who I was. I'm so thankful. I'm so troubled. I don't like how life is going right now, but whoa, praise God, it's not going how it was before. How many of us could walk in thanksgiving if we would just remember what it was like or would be like to not have Christ? If we would remember, man, I don't like how life is going, but whoa, what was life like without Jesus? If you remember, man, I don't like where my life is at right now. I don't like the position I'm in right now. I don't like the job I'm in right now. I don't like the situation in my body and in my health. I don't like where I'm at, but man, am I glad not to be where I was which is apart from Christ, which is without God and without hope in the world. This is going to change so much of your life is if you would remember. You know the main problem Israel had in the Old Testament is that they would forget. God would save. God would deliver. They would forget They would be unthankful. They would sin and destroy themselves. God would save. God would deliver. They would forget. They would be ungrateful. They would lose perspective. They would sin and destroy themselves. And over and over and over and over again, this is why he says, remember. Remember what it was like or what it even would be like apart from Christ. And therefore, now find your place in him. You are not where you would like to be, but you are not where you were before. And be thankful and let your heart be filled with gratitude. Some of us are so discontent because we don't remember. Some of us are so troubled about our future because we don't remember what our future held apart from Christ. Some of us are so worried about the present because we don't remember what it was like apart from Christ. Or because we're not taking time to consider what my life would be like. How many of you would stand up and shout to the Lord and say, I don't know where I'd be right now if God hadn't stepped in. You say, man, if God didn't step in and I kept doing things my way, I wouldn't like where I was right now. So praise God, that's not the case. This is what he's getting them to do. 
how do they find their place again? How do you find your place again? Is you remember what it was or you consider what it would be like to be apart from Christ. Because here's the reality of being apart from Christ. He describes it theologically here with circumcision and uncircumcision. And so he calls them the uncircumcision, which is basically a reference to Gentiles, which is a reference to anyone outside of the Jewish people, which in the Old Testament are the people of God. So to call someone uncircumcised or a Gentile is basically to say they are uh, homeless. They have no place. They do not belong. And so he's talking to this group of people who do not belong with God's people. This is the natural state of mankind. So we saw this two weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, where we learned that we are by nature, the Bible says, children of wrath, which means it is our nature to not be in the right place, which means that the life that is handed to us is a life out of place which is the reason why some of you are struggling so often is because your life will never make sense until you find it in Jesus. You're, you were born out of place. The things have never been in the right place, and so you haven't lived in peace. This is true of all of us, and this is how he describes the Gentiles, which for most of us is all of us, Gentiles apart from Christ, not Jewishly, ethnic, or any of that. And we say, okay, Now this is the reality of our lives. We are strangers. So what does it mean to be the uncircumcised? Okay, it just means to be on the outside, okay? Not to belong with the people of God. Well, what's the problem with that? Some of you say, well, life is pretty good. You know, I don't have to I don't have to live by all these rules. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to do this. I can just do whatever I want. Which, you know, how's that working out for you? I don't think I have to talk too much about that. It's not really giving you what you thought. But you say, what's the problem with being outside of, the, outside of the people of God? What's the problem with being separated from God? What's the problem with being a stranger to God? Well, here's, here's what the Bible would call here. I call this the biblical version of stranger danger, okay? Stranger danger. You know, some of you, obviously, with your kids, you're always training them. Okay, don't, if a stranger comes up to you, don't talk to them. You know, like, don't get in the van. Okay, stranger danger. Well, here's the real stranger danger of the Bible. Here's stranger danger Bible version, is the danger of being a stranger to the promises of God. What's the problem of living apart from God? Is you're living apart from the promises of God. Which means you're living apart from the person in the presence of God. Here's the reality for us, is that when you live as a stranger to God's presence, then you live as a stranger to peace for your presence. When you live as a stranger to God's promises, you live as a stranger to peace for your future. When you live as a stranger to the cross and the blood of Christ, then you live as a stranger to forgiveness for your sin. You cannot make peace from your past until you find forgiveness in your present. You are living as a stranger to God, and it is creating being a stranger to all good things. This is why the Bible says here, verse 12, therefore they, are, they have no hope and are without God in the world. Here's the simple Bible summary of this. Godlessness leads to hopelessness. And once again, all my brothers and sisters in Christ say, amen. I remember what it was like to not have or not live in the hope of Christ Godlessness leads to hopelessness. And for so many of you here or watching online or whatever the case may be, your hopelessness is a symptom of godlessness because how could you feel good about your future if you don't have promises from the one who knows it? How are you supposed to feel hopeful about what's to come if you don't have a guarantee from the one who can make it happen? The reason you're hopeless is because you're putting your life in your hands. The reason you're hopeless is because you're putting your life in someone else's hands. But what you need isn't the promise you can give to yourself, which is unsure, or the promise someone can make to you, which is unsure, but you need the promise from God that is sure to pass. And the reason so many of my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ are living so hopeless is because you are living godless. And though you know Christ, you are not living in the way that he would want, and it is creating this hopelessness in your life. To be without God is to be without hope. So to live not mindful of God, even as a Christian, is to live without hope. So godlessness leads to hopelessness. What's the problem of being apart from God? Well, it is you do not have access to the God of all hope, who, as we're going to see offers salvation in the name of Jesus. 
Some of you know God, but you're not dealing with life in accordance with the truth of who he is. Though you have been made a friend, you are still living as a stranger. And if you live as a stranger, you will have all the symptoms of someone apart from Christ. You see what I'm saying? If you live as a stranger, you will not enjoy the benefits of being a friend or a family member, of being close to God. And although you know the reality of who God is for you, you are living as a stranger to what he wants to be for you now. And therefore, you are hopeless, unsettled, unsure, anxious, overwhelmed, stressed, hurried, and just not quite. So that's step number one. How do I get my life back in place? I remember what I was or where I was or who I was. And as I said to some of you, that's true of you now. And the only way to resolve that is to put your faith and trust in Christ. So number two, what's the next step to getting my life back in place? It's to rejoice in what Christ has done. So consider the overwhelming nature of 11 and 12, the verses separated from Christ, aliens to the promises, not belonging, not having a place. This is not a good situation. And then verse 13 comes in, two of the most significant words you should ever plug into your life, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by what? have been brought near by all the good things that you tried to do, have been brought near by going to church consistently, have been brought near by serving the poor, have been brought near by finally getting your life together. No, what does it say? Have been brought near by the blood of Christ. If you were not the original solution for your life, then you are not the current solution for your life. If the blood of Christ was what reconciled you and brought you back to the place you belong, then it is the blood and the person and the work of Christ that will reconcile you today and in five minutes and in next two hours and tomorrow. It is Christ himself who gives you place. And if that was true when you first received him, it is true just as much today. It is the blood of Christ. It is not something you can earn or do for yourself. It is by the blood, and the blood is inserted into the midst of your unsettledness. This is the but now, but now. I love this phrase, but now in Christ. You need to shove that statement into your life currently as it is. To say, but now, in the midst of my unsettledness, but now I have hope in Christ Jesus. I may have been wandering far from God, but now I have a future in Christ Jesus. I was lost, this is the testimony of the believer, but now I am found. How crazy is it to be found and then live as if you are still lost? You need to shove this into your life now. You need to remember and you need to use it now. The testimony of what Christ has done for you. I was anxious, but now I have peace in the Prince of Peace. I was hopeless, but now I am hopeful. I was afraid, but now I am courageous. I was lonely, but now I have a family. I was completely out of place, but now by the blood of Jesus Christ, I have a place with him. I will live today as if the same thing is true every day of my life. But now, but now, I hate my job, but now Christ is enough for me. I wish I had a spouse, but now Christ is my place for me. So he continues and he says, verse 14, for he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. Listen, as we talked about before, this scripture is all about peace. He's going to say it four times, and we'll read it as it goes. But he's going to use the word peace four times, and he's going to talk about the result of getting your life in place with God is peace. That is true now, 
and it is also true perfectly forever. The end goal of God is a place of perfect peace for his people where we will all flourish together without sin, without sadness, without suffering. Life will be at perfect peace. That is what Jesus has bought for us, but it is also what he wants you to experience now. This is God's desired outcome for you, which is why for some of you, your life will always feel out of place until you place your life in Christ. This is your call today is to put your life in Christ. You will never experience the peace of God apart from him. And some of you as well, you're Christians. You're following Christ, but you're not living in light of what Jesus has done for you. I want you to write this down and live by it. You will consistently feel out of place unless you intentionally abide in Christ. Okay, if he himself is our peace then the only way to access the peace that puts me in my proper place that allows me to live in the context that God wants for me is to abide in him. And so you know the truth about what Jesus has done for you, but you're not abiding in it, and so you're a stranger to the promises of God. You're not taking hold of that for which God has bought for you. And so some of you, this is your first time you need. Your life will feel out of place unless you place it in Christ. You need to put your trust in him. That is the call of God. But also So for many of you, the symptom of your unsettledness and feeling out of place is that you're not intentionally abiding in Christ. This is once again when things we always talk about, like prayer and Bible study and meeting up with other Christians throughout the week in groups and praying for another and serving. This is why we're always talking about these things, and I want you to view them not as an obligation but as an invitation. Stop worrying about whether you can check it off and say, man, I don't like the feeling of being out of place. And that is unnecessary. I can actually access the place for which I was made in the presence of God through reading the scriptures. And as I get into the scriptures, I find my place and what God has promised. Why do you feel so out of place coming into church this morning? It might simply be because you haven't found your place from the scriptures from God this week. You might feel out of place simply because you haven't prayed and found your place with God. It's not an obligation. It's an invitation. Do you like feeling unsettled? God wants to give you your place. It's not going to make anything magically go away, of course, but this is so true for us to say we have to intentionally abide in these things. So this is what Jesus has done for us. Once again, this phrase here, he is my peace. He himself, I mean, it overemphasizes it. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Therefore, peace is not a situation. Peace is a person. And you have been looking for peace in a different situation all the while the person was right in front of you. You have missed peace, not because your life isn't working out, because you're not fixing your eyes on the person of peace. The Bible calls him Isaiah 9, the prince of peace. If peace is not a situation, then I can be in any situation and have peace as long as I'm with the person of peace, Jesus Christ. Your lack of peace is not, let me tell you, not because of the badness of your situation. That's what Psalm 23 is for. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, what? Does anybody know the rest of that? They what? Comfort me. What does that mean? That means as I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I have the peace that the first part of the chapter said was by still waters and in green pastures. So whether I'm by still waters and in green pastures or walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I have the same thing. Why? Why? Because peace is not in the valley, and peace is not on the mountaintop, and peace is not found in good health, and peace is not taken away by bad health, and peace is not given by new jobs or taken away by different jobs. Peace does not change itself out. Peace is a person, and that person is available to you in any job, in any situation, in any health circumstance at all times. You have been looking for a situation, but you need to fix your eyes on the person, Jesus Christ. He is your peace. He is your peace. And also, if it's a person, and it's Jesus, and through faith in Jesus, I always have Jesus, that means I always have peace, which, here's it is for you, you don't lease peace, you own it. And you need to stop living as if you have to give it back. 
you don't lease peace. Why? Because Jesus bought it for you. How? By the blood of Christ. You don't lease peace, and that's how you're living. Say, man, I enjoyed that car for a year, but I can't afford it anymore. So I got to give it back. As if you paid for the peace you had in the first place. It was bought for you by Jesus. It's a gift that was given to you. You own it. It's your house. It's your car. Live in it. You don't have to give it back. You don't have to exchange it out. You don't have to make monthly payments for it. It was bought for you by Jesus. He has given it to you by a gift. You access this by faith. Which is why peace is not a result of your circumstances and why peace is not a feeling. Because you say, I feel unsettled. And you can feel unsettled and still live in peace because you don't live by feelings but faith. Feelings are bad leaders. Let faith lead the way. Your life can be unsettled, but you can be at peace within your soul. Because you live by faith, you take hold of what Jesus has bought for you. And you increase your ability to live by faith when you increase your time with God. It's that simple. As I spend time with God, I am not a stranger to his promises. If I'm not a stranger to his promises, then I'm filled with hope. Why? Because I know who he is for me. I know what he will be for me. I know that his plans are good, even in the midst of suffering and pain. Because I have his promises, I can live in peace. And where do I get his promises? By just sitting in meditation. No, I read the Bible. You see, it's not an obligation. It's an invitation. You don't lose peace. And some of you are not living in peace because you simply are constantly giving it back. This is something you own and it's something you keep. And it's nice. Some of you are not living in peace because, once again, your circumstances or situation is determining that and that being the case is like you, li- you having an old, old beat up car that the wheels are falling off and it shakes every time you hit the brakes and you wonder why you feel unsettled. And if you were riding in my car that shook every time it hit the brakes and that every time I got over 50 started feeling like the wheels were gonna come off, you'd feel a little unsettled. But that's the truth for you and for me is that Jesus has bought real peace, the kind that doesn't fade, basically like a limo of peace for you to ride in that goes through the valley and up, you know. It goes everywhere. It doesn't mean your life's always gonna be great, but you're in the same car. And because you've placed your peace in a situation or a person or an outcome or a circumstance, every time you start riding, it starts feeling like the wheels will come off and eventually they do. That's what happens when your peace is in a situation, when your peace is in a circumstance, when God has bought you the kind of peace that is stable even amidst rough terrain, right? You're in an old 1992 Saturn and God wants to give you a 2023 Humvee, okay, to get through the tough terrain of your life, okay? Now, before somebody clips that and says, Nate says God's gonna buy you a Humvee, that was a metaphor, okay? (laughs) So let's just be clear. But you don't lease peace, you own it. And some of you need to take it back today by faith, not because you feel better, not even because this sermon or this service makes you feel anything, but because that's what God said and you put your faith in what God has said. So that's the second thing. This is true not only between us and God, but as the scripture unfolds here, this is true. Think about how peaceful that child is at. You know, he's not worried. He's laughing. He ain't even concerned about that, you know. He doesn't even know what I'm saying. Why is he at peace? He's sitting with his parents. That's why. That's what it's supposed to be like. The peace of knowing God is a person. He's with me. He'll take care of me. You think my five-year-old worries about how the, bill, how the house is going to get paid? You think he wakes up thinking, man, I hope I have a house next month. You know, you think my kids wake up. I mean, obviously kids have anxiety for different reasons, but not not for taking care of their life. You think my kids worry about that stuff? No. And if they did, I'd say, how crazy is that? You're not responsible for that. That's on me. That's what God says to you. You're his child. You're not responsible for that. That's on God. As long as you stay near him, you got the protection and peace of your good heavenly father. And you should live always at peace with him. This is what God wants for you. Not only with God, but also for one another. Look what it says. He himself is our peace, verse 14, who has made us 
both one, so that's Jews and Gentiles, who hated one another. And he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This is so intertwined, it's almost hard to tell when he's talking about peace with God and peace with one another. And what does this mean? This means that if God has made himself at peace with you, then he has made himself, then he has made you to be at peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It is literally the same. The same thing. If God has reconciled you to himself and he doesn't think just in individuals but in families as the people of God, then he has reconciled us. And if we are reconciled to God, we are reconciled to one another. The beauty of the gospel here is that Jews and Gentiles, they hated each other. There was racism. There was cultural boundaries. There was disdain. There was partiality. There was favoritism. All the things you could think about that would make groups divide, which are the same things we experience today. And now Paul comes in and says, not only has Christ bought you by his blood, but he's bought all of us. And not only has he bought us, but he's made us into this one new man. Meaning we are so intertwined with one another, we become one new group with God together. And we bring all of our culturals and preferences and differences into this. It's beautiful, but we are now one together in Christ, which means this. And this is something I will speak very directly to because this is important. A divisive Christian is anti-gospel. You see how important this is? The the peace we have with one another is intertwined with the peace we have with God. Like I said, it's hard to even understand sometimes where he's talking about one or the other. It's both at the same time. And so if I am not at peace with you, or if I am being divisive or gossiping or being partial towards you, I am being anti-gospel. This is why this is so important. It's not just a nice thing to have. Division to God amongst the people of God is unacceptable. Gossip is unacceptable. To gossip is to say the same thing as I hate and don't believe in the Son. I do not need the blood of Christ. That's what you say when you're partial towards one another. When we divide over political preferences and say, well, one party, you can't be a Christian and possibly vote that way. We're being anti-gospel. This is not just nice. I want to hear you. It's unacceptable. Why? Because it's blasphemous. So obviously we sin against one another. We're not perfect. But if Christ has forgiven us, we ought to forgive one another. We ought to give each other the mutual benefit of the doubt. We certainly ought to keep our lips from ever saying anything divisive. We ought not to judge lest we ourselves be judged in certain things that are preferential, not biblical. And you see it all around us. Christians dividing over the dumbest of things. And as much as I can do it here, that will not be us. It will not be. By the grace of God but I just want you to hear it straight. I hope most of this sermon encourages you, but if you're out here gossiping, being divisive, judging how people vote, being partial, showing favorites, you are being anti-gospel. And to do so is the same thing as saying out loud, I do not believe or need the blood of Christ. He's intertwined them so much, so I want you to see and feel the force of that. And obviously, once again, yeah, we, we mess that up all the time. Yeah, we show favoritism. Yeah, we're partial. Yeah, we're stupid. Yeah, we say dumb things. Yeah, we talk behind backs when we shouldn't. None of those things are acceptable. But you have to go and say, okay, I'm going to, by the blood of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit in me, I'm going to take this very seriously. And theologically now, it's to say, me and you are one. We are not different. We are not separate. We are one in Christ Jesus. So the reality here, he says, he's broken down the wall between us. And so God has, Jesus has broken down the wall that separated you and God, but he's also broken down the wall that separated you and one another. And how blasphemous is it if Jesus broke down a wall that we would build another one up? If he broke down the wall that divides me and you, then I cannot let bitterness against you build another one up. If he broke down a wall against me and you, I cannot let an unforgiving spirit build another one up. If he broke down the wall that exists between me and you, I cannot let political or cultural differences build another one up. There is no wall. It has been broken down by the blood of Christ. And that is how we ought to live with one another. Because when we live that way, the world sees it and they point their face to God. That's the whole point. Unity 
proves the gospel. Disunity, anti-gospel. They should be able to look at our oneness from different cultures, different races, different languages, different perspectives, different backgrounds, different political preferences. We come together as one because we fix our eyes on Jesus because our peace was never in a political party and our peace was never in a certain racial group and our peace was never in a culture or a background. Our peace was never in a particular country. Our peace has always been the same person together, Jesus Christ. So if we fix our eyes on the person of peace, listen to me, then we will live at peace with one another. The reason why it's so hard for you to forgive is because you, think, you, th- you keep thinking about what that person has done for you, done to you, instead of what Christ has done for you. And if you would start thinking about what Christ has done for you, God would, by his spirit, give you the power to forgive what they have done to you. The person annoys you and bothers you so much because you keep thinking about what they do to you, or you keep thinking about how annoying that chip sound is. You know, my wife hates it when I eat crunchy things near her. You know, she got it from her dad. They all hate that noise, you know? And some of us live like other people do that or bother us like that all the time. But you know what makes it worse? When you keep thinking about it. As opposed to putting your affection and attention on Christ. This is why through prayer and just through Restore and all of our environments, the main goal of City Light is to minister to Jesus Christ to put our attention on Jesus because from that place, all other ministries to one another flow. Because we're at peace with God, we should be at peace with one another. And any division is absolutely anti-gospel and unacceptable. Okay, here's the final step. Realize who you are now. So the first, remember what you were. The second, rejoice in what Christ has done. The third, realize who you are now. This is verse 19, he says, so then... So you see how this goes? Verse 11, like this is who you are, who you were. Verse 13, but now in Christ. And then verse 19, so then, so this is Bible reading. It's sending me into new places for new things, new concepts. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens and saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. And the Lord in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Here's a, a simple sentence for this, is that when you find your place, you can live with purpose. And here's the little trick for so many of you. When you don't have a place, your purpose is to find a place. So you can't live your purpose because you're too busy trying to find a place. When your purpose is to find a place, you will never live in purpose because you will never find the place. No matter what you get in life, no matter what the world throws at you, no matter how successful, whatever it is that you get, it will never work. No matter what access you get to any group, it will never work. And you spend your whole life trying to find a place when you could simply receive your place in the world through the blood of Jesus Christ. That you are now a citizen of God's kingdom and a child in God's family. And as soon as you are secure in your place, then you are free to live with purpose. And some of us are not living with purpose because we think our purpose is to find a place. And if you're too busy trying to get accepted into a particular group or trying to get to the final situation that you would like to have or have the job or the relationship or anything that you would like to get, your purpose will always be to find a place and therefore you will live purposeless, which is why once again, you will feel hopeless and unsettled. But when your purpose comes from the place you have in Christ, you can live to the max, the life God has given you. He says you are strangers and aliens, but now you are citizens and members of the house. I mean, to be a stranger and an alien, by definition, is to not have a place. It just means to be out of place, basically, you know, to not belong. And you go from that to being a citizen and a member of the house. So here's the reality for us. When things are back in place, we don't live as if they are out of place. You know, when the room is finally cleaned and the office is finally organized, you don't bear the burden of it not being so, right? You don't walk into a clean room and think, oh, I have to pick up the clothes off the floor and do all this work, you know? No, what do you do? You walk into a clean room and you fall on the bed and say, oh, this is nice, you know? You don't walk into your office when it's, un- when it's organized and think, well, I gotta move this, I gotta move that. No, you just sit down and you get to work. When, you're, when things are in place, right, you don't live as if they are out of place, if you finally find the keys, you don't live as if you, don't, if you can't drive anywhere. It'd be crazy to find your keys and still walk around pouting because you can't drive anywhere. This is the reality for us now, right? In Christ, isn't it? Is that he's cleaned the room through Jesus Christ. Why are we going to live in shame and guilt? Your room is not messy. Why? Not because of you. Because the blood of Jesus has wiped it clean. So why do you live under guilt and condemnation? 
when we find our place, we don't live as if we have no place. This is true all the time in our lives. This should be true for us. If we found the keys, we can drive anywhere. And if you have the peace of God, you can go anywhere and be in any situation and still have peace. If you've been forgiven, then you can forgive. If God has been gracious to you, you can live with grace. If God has wiped your slate clean, you can do so for others. You see what I'm saying? When you find your place and all the things that come with that, right? As, when you have a family, you don't go looking for another one, right? I mean, some of you do maybe when you're mad and you're like 18, okay? And you're like, I, I hate all these things, okay? Right? But generally speaking, you don't go looking for another one. Like, this is, you have a place. You have a place. And so stop looking for another one. You have an identity as a child of God. Stop looking for another one. You have a purpose in the mission of God. Stop looking for another one. You have peace already from God. Stop looking for another place to get it. When you realize who you are, you can live in accordance with what Christ has done, which is the final piece of this, that we are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the ultimate end, and this is the reality we should experience together. This is what the Bible would call real shalom. This is peace that we are God's dwelling place, that he lives in us, that we live in him. And together, as we experience God together, we are growing together into this wonderful place in which God dwells. And where God dwells, there is perfect peace. So as we said in the beginning, when the right things are in place, we can live in peace. And whenever you feel out of place, remember the three steps. Remember what you were, rejoice in what Christ has done, and realize who you are now. All right, let's pray and let's respond to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for giving us place, Lord. We thank you for, by the blood of Jesus, bringing us into your family. I pray that if there's anybody in the room or listening online that that's not true of yet, that you would compel them by your love to trust in you and put their faith in you. I pray for all of us that we would not live as strangers to your promises, that we would not live as strangers to your presence, that we would not live as strangers to peace that we would not live unsettled and out of place, but that we would find our place in you. We thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's respond to the Lord.